So now let's see, can we find a different way of writing I? Can we write something in the second expression so that in both cases we get the same answer? That's what we'd like to do. Now, um, so, let's come back to this capacitor. And now, let's work out what is the field inside the capacitor. So if this is an infinitely charged sheet that's positively charged, the field points like that. What's the strength of the field? So 1 over epsilon naught for the medium. The charge density sigma and a factor of 1 half. Why 1 half? Because it can go in two directions. Everyone happy with that? For the negatively charged plate, now the field lines all come in. What's the strength of the field from the negatively charged plate? Exactly the same, right? Why? Because we've got the same charge building up on this plate as we have on that plate because the current here is the same as the current there. So we have 1 over epsilon naught, sigma 1 over 2. So what's the field over here? Zero. So here, the mod of E is naught. What's the field over here? What's the field in the middle? Good. <coughs> if I write sigma in terms of Q, what is sigma in terms of Q? Q over A epsilon naught. What is the current equal to? dQ dt. So if I take a time derivative of E, so E is equal to Q over A epsilon naught, the magnitude of E. So what is dE dt? I over A epsilon naught. Now, on the top board, I was getting mu naught I. So what, what will I get if I calculate, uh, where do I want to put this? Maybe I'll put it just above. What do I get if I calculate d by dt of the integral of e dot dA? This will give me, the integral of e dot dA will give me q over epsilon naught. Which is? I over epsilon naught. Everyone happy with that? Good. So what will I get from D by dt of mu naught epsilon naught dE dt dot dA. Mu 
loc să rămân pașii în scălării pe pașii. How is this related to that? Exactly the same, except here I'm multiplying by mu naught epsilon naught. If I multiply that by mu naught epsilon naught, what do I get? Mu naught i. Everyone happy? But this is that. So I'm going to change Ampere's law. I'm going to change Ampere's law as follows. On this side, I'm going to say plus mu naught epsilon naught de dt. Now let's see what happens. So, if I do exactly the same thing that I did before, I need to add the extra term to the stop equation. So I need to say plus mu naught epsilon naught integral de dt dot dA. But here, on the piece of wire, okay, the current is flowing with a steady rate. What does Ohm's law tell us? J, the current density, is proportional to the electric field. So if the current density is not changing with time, what could you tell me about the electric field? Not changing with time. So what does this term contribute? Nothing. So only this term contributes and we get mu naught i. Okay? And now, if we do the same thing but now for this surface, we find the integral over s of the curl of b dot dA is equal to integral j dot dA plus mu naught epsilon naught integral dE dt dot into dA. What does this term contribute? Zero. Because the surface goes in between the plates of the capacitor. So this time that term is naught. On the top blackboard that term is naught. What does this term give us? Mu naught i. So now, it doesn't matter how you draw your surface. If you go in between the plates of the capacitor, or you cut the wire, you get the same answer. That now makes sense as an equation. Everyone happy with that? So that's our guess for how we should fix um, Ampere's law. And that extra term is called the Maxwell correction. Now how did we figure out that there was a problem with Ampere's law? By looking at? Conservation. conservation of charge. So let's now try to look at conservation of charge again and see is there still a problem or has this fixed the problem? Yes, I'll tell you. You mean why do we take d by dt? Oh, that was a test. Good. Now, um, let's check charge conservation. So 
So let's work out what is uh, d rho dt. So this is equal to d by dt of epsilon naught divergence of E. When I write this, what have I used? The gas flow. Good. That's all I used. And I will say that this is epsilon naught times the divergence of the E dt. Am I allowed to do that? Yeah. Good. I'm just commuting two derivatives that commute, right? And now I can read the E dt from the corrected version of Ampere's law. So I'm going to put in the E dt now. So this will be equal to epsilon naught times the divergence of if I want the EDT I need to take this over to that side so I'll get the curl of B I will get minus mu naught J and I need to divide by mu naught epsilon naught what is the divergence of a curl? zero, so I can forget that term. So I'll end up getting just the divergence of J. There's a minus sign. Divergence of J. I've got a mu naught times epsilon naught, but I'm dividing by mu naught times epsilon naught. So now the rho dt is equal to minus the divergence of J. I didn't even use charge conservation. So in actual fact, I can remove that equation because charge conservation follows from Maxwell's equations now. So not only is it consistent with charge conservation, charge conservation now is a consequence of those equations. Okay? Is everyone convinced we fixed the problem? Good. Okay. Now, let's think about this term that Maxwell added. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at that coefficient. So we can write this as mu naught over 4 pi times by 4 pi epsilon naught. What is mu naught over 4 pi? 10 to the minus 7. What is, what is 4 pi epsilon naught? Ten. 10 to the minus 10. Okay, now I want to be a bit more accurate. 1 over 9 times 10 to the 9. So I can write this as 1 over 10 to the plus 7. 10 to the plus 7 times 10 to the plus 9 is 10 to the 16. So this is... 1 over 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. What is that? Speed of light squared. So can you guys see this term is minute. Its coefficient is 1 over the speed of light squared. Of course no one had seen that in experiments so far. This extra term that Maxwell added was a tiny little term. You couldn't even detect it in experiment. Why did Maxwell add it? He knew that there was a problem with the equations before he added them. That was his only motivation. So what did he want? He wanted to unify these equations, put them together. And by wanting to unify them, he was forced to add this extra term. Okay? Good. Now um, that we have added that correction, we have a complete set of equations. Those four equations describe for you the electric and magnetic fields completely. 
there's one more equation that we need to add, which is what is the force felt by a charged particle. So if we have a charged particle, we can add one more uh, formula. Who can tell me what that is? F is equal to? QE plus Q V cross D. Very good. Now, let's just think about this. We said most of the things that we see in our everyday lives can be explained by electromagnetism, the vast majority. All of electromagnetism is caught in those five equations. That's really remarkable. Such a beautiful description of nature. Okay? So, so when you look at this, you should be really amazed. More amazed than you look right now. <laughs> okay. How did Maxwell know that the term that he added was in fact correct? So he added this term, he saw it fixed the old problem, but if you really want to prove that your theory is correct, what you should try to do is make a prediction. Predict something that no one else has predicted before then. And Maxwell did try to make a prediction. What he tried to do is he asked himself the question, what happens if there's no sources? Let's set the charge density to zero and let's set the current density to zero. So there's no charges and no currents. If we solve those equations, can we still find a solution with non-zero electric field and magnetic field? And his answer to that question was, yes, you can. And the solution that he found was light. Okay? So we're going to do that now. Let's try to switch the charge density off and the current density off, and let's see if we can find a solution. And we're going to do it by the, the, the favorite method of physicists. What's the favorite method to solve an equation? Yes. Guess it. Okay? This is by far the best method. Good. Um. So the equations that we're going to try to solve are Maxwell's equations when there are no sources. So let's say solving the source-free Maxwell's equations. And by source-free, we mean the charge density is zero and the current density is zero. So in this case, the equations that we want to solve is the divergence of E is zero, because rho is zero. The curl of E is minus db dt. The divergence of b is 0. And the curl of b is equal to mu naught, epsilon naught, dE dt. What we're going to do is, we're just going to guess an answer. And if we guess wrong, that's fine. We'll just rub it out and make a new guess. And keep going until we get a solution. So you, you, uh, you shouldn't be scared of making a guess. Nothing bad can happen to you. Okay? Now, let's calculate, first of all, what is the divergence of E. So this will be equal to 
derivative with respect to x of the x component of e plus derivative with respect to y of the y component of e plus derivative with respect to z of the z component of e. I'm going to try to make the simplest guess. Let me just guess that ex is not 0, so ey and ez are 0. Just a guess. So I'm going to imagine that ey is naught and ez is naught. Then the only thing that this equation tells me is ex doesn't depend on x. Everyone happy with that? So in actual fact, just again, and just guessing, E could be equal to EX, I'll let it depend on Z only, and T, and uh, X hat. If I make this choice for the electric field, I know that that equation is satisfied. <coughs> Are we all happy with that? Good. Now, if I've got A cross B is equal to C, what can you tell me about the direction of C as compared to the directions of A and B? So C is perpendicular to A and B, right? With that logic, looking at this equation, here's B sitting over here. Here I've got a cross product. So it seems natural to think B and E will be perpendicular. So if B points in some direction, I want it to point in a direction that is orthogonal to E. Just guessing again. And I want the divergence of B to be 0. So what I'm going to do is, I want B to be orthogonal to E. So I will imagine that B is equal to just a y component. So this points now in the y direction, that points in the x direction. Good. E and B are orthogonal. I'm going to again imagine it depends on z and t, and there is a y hat. So now I know that that equation is also satisfied. The divergence of B is 0. Okay? What I want you guys to do now is to take this E and this B and plug them in to Faraday's law. And tell me what does Faraday's law say? So try that now, guys. Plug it into Faraday's law. Tell me what you get. If you need help, Put your hand up.
Who's got an answer? Saga, what did you get? So for the curl of E, which term contributes? This first term? Is that the term that contributes? No? Okay. So that term doesn't contribute. Does this one? No? Does that one? No? That one? This one? This one? That one? Yes. So we just get y hat, the e x dz. So the curl of e, is y hat, the e x dz. And this must be equal to minus d by dt of this, okay? <clears throat> and lucky for us, this vector points along y hat, that vector points along y hat. So what does this equation actually tell us? The e x dz is equal to the b y dt. So I'm going to keep that equation. The e x d z is equal to minus the b y d t. Good. This came from Faraday's law. Now I want you guys to work out what does Ampere's law with Maxwell's correction tell us. Good. Husam, what did you get? Minus partial d y. Minus partial d by d y? Yes. Yes? Yes, that is. B y. Oh, b y. Yes. Okay, good. In the x direction. Yes. Is equal to? No, by, by dz. By yes. dz. <coughs> time, time, x. Oh, good. In the x direction, you mean? Good, yes, is equal to? Mu naught, epsilon, epsilon naught. Mu naught, epsilon naught. D by dt, yes. The e x dt. In the x direction. Who else calculated that? Is this what you got? 
Al Zara, what did you get? Okay, now, does B have an X component? So let's see if I agree with the sign. Okay, happy? Yes, so some, I think that that looks perfect. So um, this is what comes from Ampere's law. So I'm going to remove the x hats, which are common on either side. And this equation is what we get from Ampere's law plus Maxwell's correction. Where is Maxwell's correction in this equation? In this term over here, right? And this tells us if Maxwell's correction wasn't here, what would it tell you about by? By cannot depend on Z, because this would have been naught. But if By cannot depend on Z, okay, if this side cannot depend on Z, that side can't depend on Z, right? And you would have landed up not being able to get a non trivial solution. So it's very important that this extra term that Maxwell had was sitting there. And we're going to see actually what does it mean. But now I think we'll take a break for 10 minutes. So let's stretch our legs and then we'll come back and finish this off.